place. This is Integrity and Dating, a bigger view beyond the tangles. My name is Greg Shu. I'm a staff member at the University of Virginia. I am the of Asian University Christian College. This is my third year on staff. And uh, those of you I've met before and seen before, it's great to see you again. I'm glad you're here. This is a popular one, obviously, because, you know, let's be honest, what are we really interested in? Here we go. Um, so, yeah, this workshop, Integrity and Dating. Um, my hope here is that we would get a bigger picture of what it is that God means for us and intends for us when it comes to relationships. Um, you know, no matter how much or how little church you've had in your life, uh, dating is a confusing thing, and Christian dating is actually even more confusing. Uh, I pity the poor person who goes into small group and says, hey, I like this guy, and gets bombarded by all these questions and all these really long words that you don't really understand. You know, so I know what it can be like. Um, if any of you in here is, a, is not a Christian, I hope in particular that as we talk about the nature of love and the way that God intended it to be, that you would hear that actually God is good in every aspect of life, not just in dating relationships, but you would see that, you know, the rest of us follow him here because he's worth it, and he's awesome, you know, so I just, I hope that's a word for you. Um, yeah, let me, let me say a quick prayer for us, and then we'll begin. So thanks for the time we can be here together uh, this weekend to meet you in this, in these really deep and important and heavy places, God, we pray that as we consider our hearts and our sexu sexuality, God, our sexual natures, God, that we would meet you and you would show us that you have a plan, you had a design that is good and generous for us, that we need to uh, move back to that and reach you in that. I pray that whatever place we're coming from here, that we would hear your voice here, that more than just a model to learn or write down or talk about, we would hear your voice through any words that I would say, God, that we would see ourselves as you see us and recognize what you are saying to us, not just a diagram or, or points to draw down on a piece of paper. God, we thank you for this time. Uh, let us all hear what you have for us to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. So, if you're a Christian, um, you think about dating, all of us Christians, no matter kind of where we are, you have some sense of, like, when you date, God seems to be involved somehow. It helps the whole thing run. But that can get really complicated when you think about how exactly is God supposed to help us do that. That's why you get all these books and models and pastors saying, this is the way, that's the way, don't do this, do do this, and it's like, ah, what's happening? Um, I hope that as we spend time together here today, we'd step back and get a bigger picture. A bigger picture. And I'm going to allow you, in your own relationship with the Lord, to discern what it is that God is calling you to do and how to conduct yourself. But I want to own for the bigger picture so that all those theological terminologies, they have a place to live instead of beginning with them and kind of reverse engineering something, which is usually what's happening in our Christian experience. It's something we want. Bigger picture first. But to do that, we have to begin by asking for a second, what would relations look like if there were no God? If there were no God, how would relations look like? Well, uh, just thinking about it and also my own personal experience, what you end up having is simply there's only two parties involved. When two parties involved, there's a relationship, and God does not exist. God does not exist, all you have is this. A man and a woman, and the only directionality that can go is between each other. And how would you know then if a relationship is going well? Well, the only two way, the only way you can judge it is sort of like how you're connecting with each other. And what you bring into this interaction are your expectations and desires. And so all you have to judge if this is going well or how this is going are your own expectations and decides. This, I would say, is a we-centric relationship. The only two gravitational bodies in this space are these two people, man and woman, exerting forces upon each other. And if you look at how a relationship like this actually works, it usually looks like exerting or conceding power. I want something. You want something. I'll give you this something, but not that something. And if you give me this something this often, then maybe I'll give you that something when you ask in this way. Exerting power, appeasing, and taking is usually the cycle that it ends up falling into. And that's actually not how God talks about relationships. It's not about power. It's about love. You think about it, you know, so maybe, maybe your boyfriend, he's only sweet to you when you service him sexually, so you do. Or maybe your girlfriend, she only wants to hang out with you, you know, when you bought her presents, so you do. But it's giving or taking, taking and giving, giving this but not that. It's a conflict, it's exerting or conceding power. And the problem with this is that it actually allows for very unhealthy desires and expectations to flourish. Because all you have to go by are, what do I want, what does the other person want? 
Are we getting what we want? Are we giving what we want? Now, to spell out even more, this can only go usually in two ways. And the first way that it can go is conflict. Your expectations don't line up because you're two different people who want two different things. Um, you're always arguing or giving and taking and pushing and pulling. It's a gravitational push and pull all the time. Uh, you're appeasing, you're conceding, you disagree. Um, and honestly, this is like, it's very uncomfortable to be in a relationship like this. You never know if your expectations are going to be met. Um, there's no peace, there's no trust, there's no stability. And it's always selfish. Like, even if you want a good thing, the way you're going to go about thinking about it or getting it is self-oriented. Am I getting this good thing? Are you going to give this good thing? You know, can I trust you enough to kind of give this to you? You're always worried about yourself, not just like being greedy. You're always self-oriented, selfish, because you're worried about yourself. It's selfish. <coughs> Oftentimes, this will result in a breakup, right? So you've got an unmet expectation, you've got a conflict, and then eventually, you split. Because you decide that this status quo is just not good enough, I want more, he's not giving enough, I don't like giving that, I could do better, I'm tired of this, right? And like, because no one's ever going to change in a relationship that's like this. Because frankly, why would you, right? You always hold 50% of the power, right? So if they're like, I want you to do that or be like that, you're like, no. Because my vote is as much as your vote. So like, I, only do, I do what I want, right? And you do what you want. And you want me to do this, but you can't make me do that, so ha. Right? There's no impetus for change or transformation or progress. How you begin is how you end, and if you don't end up in the same place with the same expectations, you will probably come apart because, let's face it, why would you stay? So that's no good, to be honest, right? You can just go your separate ways, one or both, you quit, there's no more we. But there is another option, and actually this one's worse, because there are we-centric relationships that actually work. And friends, that's what we call codependence. Because somehow, in the way the universe has conspired against you, two people come together with the same sets of expectations or similar enough ones, that as they kind of enact this appeasing and conceding, they're happy to concede and appease. And the desires that they give kind of come back around to them somehow, and you kind of draw each other into the cycle of pleasing and appeasing and appeasing, and it seems to be drawing you forward, and it looks like it's good because you're happy, but actually the way you interact is like really, really not very healthy, and all your friends can tell. Codependence is bad because it's two selfish people melding together to create one larger and more annoying, more needy, more selfish entity. <laughs> it, it, look, it's mutually reinforced, right? Like, I want this, you want this, and because we're recentric, we like keep pulling each other in, it's like two plants kind of colliding into this like, one mess. And again, you can work, you can be happy, you can work as a couple, but what does it look like? It looks like codependence. You end up losing two people instead of like strengthening something, right? You, it's, that's why your friends don't like codependent friendships. Because you're annoying. But you and your significant other only is always self-centered. So friends, this is how the world dates. The world dates in self-oriented ways. It is we-centric. Now I know there are other factors like your family or other expectations on you, but like you're still the one enacting those desires and expectations. It's still you. They belong to you and the other person. We-centric is the way that the world dates when there is no God. But actually, friends, a lot of Christians... Maybe even most Christians date in we-centric ways as well. Christians can do the conflict and the codependence and be singing praise chorus and spouting theological biblical terms all the way into breakup or codependence themselves. Just because you call it a certain thing does not mean it actually is any better. Look at it. Look at what you are. Do you look like this? Maybe there are people in here. You think about your past relationships. You think about your current relationships. Think about, are we we-centric? Do we do this? Is this how we are interacting, conflict or codependence? Because that's not what God designed you for. And actually, if you look at Scripture in Genesis 3.16, the fall of man, this whole dynamic, conflict and codependence, that's foretold in Scripture. Because what happened in the fall of man is Adam and Eve did what? They made choices such that God was not with them, okay? Life apart from God life with no God, and the curse, which as Job mentioned today in the, in the talk, is like a, the set of description of the consequences, there are a couple consequences. The desire of the woman will be for her husband. That sounds like codependence. 
and uh, the way that's described there. And he will rule over her. That sounds like conflict. We-centric is the direct product of the fall. It doesn't matter how happy you are. It doesn't matter that he buys you nice stuff. It doesn't matter that she's good to you in whatever way. If you are we-centric, you're operating in a fashion that is consonant with the fall of man where there is no God. Even if you're Christian, look at yourself. Look at your actions. Look at your choices. Are we we-centric? <coughs> Because, friends, this is not a good way to go. There's much, much better. God designed us for much, much better. Some of you need to repent of this. Some of you need to search yourselves and think about the way you act and what you want and what you expect and how you get it and how you give it. Because you are we centric. You probably need to repent. Think about that. But God designed us for something much better. Much, much better. And He shows it to us in Genesis 1 and 2. He created man and woman both in the image of God, distinct, unique, but equally like Him. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper that's suitable for Adam. And so, as you understand, if you read all of Genesis, all of its beauty, and all of the way relationship is described, everything, everything in the world is in its perfect order, in its perfect place. Nothing is out of place. Every screw is perfectly tightened. Everything is perfectly set. It's running perfectly. All the interacting actors, all the pieces are in their right place. And, and so we look at Adam and Eve and God. They are in their right place with God. They are in perfect relationship with Him. And I'll explain how they're actually in perfect relationship with each other. Adam and Eve being created in the image of God. Right? The image of God is something God gives you. He supplies you with that. And so, as Adam and Eve are in the garden, they're interacting with God as He is their supplier. And as they interact with each other, they are interacting with each other in a way that is reflective of God's nature and also out of the perfect love that they have. And what we see here is that there's actually a, a structure, right, the triangular structure, where God is the big planet and the little ones are orbiting around God instead of kind of two just forces pushing at each other, right? If God is the center up here and they're orbiting around, there's a structure to the nature of the relationship. And there's also a supply that God gives, right? So the way that they know how to act is that they look at God and he sets them up in a certain kind of way. So there are values and scriptures that guide us to know what godliness is like and what kind of choices you should make. You know you should be selfless because of the nature of God and the structure that God has put us in. But in order to be selfless, you must actually be supplied by God because of His perfect love, right? Like, you cannot be perfectly selfless on your own. God is the only one who enables you to do that. And He puts you in a position and structure that can make that possible. So, you've got the triangle, which is the structure here. I don't know why I said the triangle. Uh, and you have the arrows between us and God. This is the supply. This is how God created human beings to interact. With Him... Perfectly? With each other? Perfectly. Well, let's talk about sort of what that looks like. Well, if you look at the interaction between man and woman, um, Eve is described as a helper. But as I've done some more digging, I think there's actually a, a better way to kind of think of what helper really means that reflects the structure uh, more completely. The original word in Hebrew is, is azer konegda. And in some other passages in the Old Testament, um, the, the prefix azer is often attached to the word for warrior. Particularly, uh, David's mighty men are described as azer warriors. Um, they are partner warriors, not just some like other soldier in the field. It's the guy, it's the person you lean on so that they're going to cover your back as you're fighting over here. You're going together. Your right hand, right at your side. So I think the word partner, for me, kind of captures that better. And that actually, I think, fits this um, more perfectly, it's more mutually. Um, because Eve is Adam's side-by-side -side partner. She is his counterpart, right? The call to like cultivate the garden is given to both of them. Uh, the call to produce and share, uh, have offspring over the other is given to both of them. They share that together. They're partners together in that calling, in that place. Partner. Side by side, face to face, eye to eye. Okay? Um, and then it says, well, this, the way that they've been set up as partners, they're united as one flesh. Uh, that's in chapter 2, verse 24. And, and it's not just talking about like sex. It's like, so they're married as partners, then they can have sex. That's all I'm saying. Um, it's actually something much bigger than actually the sex they're allowed to have, that they are called to have, echoes the structure that God has put them in. Not just an act, but it mirrors the nature of their relationship. 
So one flesh is not just binding genitals. <laughs> one flesh is binding two lives. So they're twice as full, twice as strong. Sex, then, is an extension of what God has given them in partnership. So like righteous sex is when two people are giving and receiving love. And so everybody has a good time. It's good. Unrighteous sex, premarital and married, yes, you can have unrighteous sex and be married, okay, is about taking something from somebody or using someone to get my own ends. That's why sort of in a lot of like sitcoms or whatever, like the husband will say, like, oh, the wife, she's not putting out. They're having unrighteous sex because they're thinking about sex as a good that you can take or require of somebody. Righteous sex, which is offered to Adam and Eve, is they share life and intimacy together. Even their sexual union mirrors the partnership that God has given them to be. It is blessing one another, partnering eye to eye, side by side, or face to face in that case. <laughs> and you also see Adam and Eve, they're naked, and they're without shame. And this is not just sort of like a physical and like sexual thing, it actually alludes to the emotional nature of the relationship. They have to hide. Why would you wear clothes if you're going to hide? You don't have anything. They're completely open. They, are, they see what's on their mind, on their heart. They share life together. They share <coughs> with each other. They're emotionally open and intimate with one another. And the reason they can do this and want what God wants for each other and interact in a sexual and emotional way that is good is because they are living within a structure that God placed and designed them for, and they're also being supplied by the love that they need in order to do it. You want to think about it this way, it could be like a racetrack that God has designed and the fuel that God has given the vehicles. You have to have both. It's structure and supply. So we've covered their spiritual components. There's an emotional component. There's a sexual component. And all those things are God's design. It's not supposed to be like, oh, like we can't talk about sex. You know, like sex is all bad. No. Just like Joe said the other night, last night, we are created as sexual beings. It's meant to be something. This is what it's meant to be. Part of this structure. And it's good. And this is good because... The expectations and interactions there that we operate by, they're not like my own anymore. They're God's. They belong to somebody else. That's awesome, I think. It's not we-centric conflict or codependence. It's dependence and design by God, upholding the kind of relationship that I really am designed for and made for. Okay, so I've been talking a little while about sort of this whole like design thing and then women and kind of like what's God done and then there's a marriage piece in there and you're like, okay, like where are we getting to dating? Where's that coming from? All right. Here we go. What's the deal with dating? Well, um, frankly, there's no biblical outline for dating. Uh, in the Bible, we have singleness, and we have marriage, which is usually arranged. Okay. So in our modern day culture, right, we have dating and, and engagement in between, right? And so, like, that's a convention of our time. That's how we sort of pers uh, pursue our relationships and kind of act them up, right? So, no pastor, no book, nobody, no pulpit can say this is what dating. Should be. You can't do that because there's no biblical model for dating. What I'm going to offer you here today, though, is what I think is a bigger picture set of principles, a shape, a territory that you can fill in what God offers you to fill in in that space. You can choose with particular phrases or rules or terminologies that you like as God leads you to conduct yourself. But I'm going to give you the bigger picture that I think is universally applicable no matter kind of where you are as a Christian. Okay? So, um, I'm done with that page, sorry. <laughs> Dating, if you look towards like the direction of like, so like if you have singleness here, then like marriage is here. Dating then is, is the process of getting to marriage. We like, we kind of have a process there for us. And so I think that, that dating is two things that we need to do. Dating is developing a God-centric partnership. Dating is also discerning God's will especially for your relationship and that partnership, if it will go particularly towards marriage. I believe these two things are always supposed to be present as you date, and everything else kind of falls into that. Um, again, we talked about there are spiritual components, emotional components, sexual components, right? Um, we want to figure out how these all fit together, but I'm going to begin, and I'm going to hit on primarily the spiritual one, because we are usually so obsessed with the emotional or like the physical one that we are underselling the spiritual one. Most of us talk about, well, I really, really like him. She's really, really, really attractive in these ways. Have you ever considered that maybe God doesn't really care about how he looks or what she's like? But what they're calling you to. We don't think very often about the spiritual nature. Because actually, most of our life is, is structured in a spiritual nature. This, this shape of relationship is true of every friendship and relationship you've ever had. Okay, not just dating. 
from, from the Starbucks that, the Starbucks barista that you're nice to, to like your little sister who you care for, this is how you actually are supposed to interact with them. Now you may be at various distances from them and interactions and intimacy with them, but you're always supposed to receive from God and want what God wants for this person. Always, okay? So if your relationships in general, the way you interact with people in general, does not look like this, you have no business being in this seminar, you should go back to sort of a general discipleship one or go to the singleness one and get your life together and to know sort of like, how can I be reflecting the, 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 the love that God has in my life as a whole? Because if you're going to go do this, you've got to be really ready to really engage with God's design for your life, regardless of a partner. Okay? That's where this begins. It's a spiritual question that we have to be asking ourselves. If you look at all relationships, it's spiritual instead of we-centric in that way. That's where we got to begin. Okay. So, let's get to dating then. So, many of you look at dating, you're really looking for a date, not a partner. But the problem is a date is an event. People are not events. People are partners. Now, I'm not trying to dictate how often you get to go out on dates or like, what kind of dates you can go on. I'm not saying it's, it's bad to go to formal with somebody who's good looking, right? I'm not saying that, right? But how do you view the people that you date or go on dates with? Do you view them in a Christ-like way that considers them as a partner? Not even some kind of like, oh, like I'm trying to size you up as a mate. But sort of like, are you, you're a person, I, I'm, I'm trying to take you seriously as a person, which means I take you seriously as a potential partner. Like I'm looking at your life and I care about you as a whole person. Not just like, what kind of food do you like, what kind of music do you listen to, you're like, how nice are you to me when we hang out? Or how well do you flirt with me? Right? That's not actually what partnership is about. You're looking at them and their character in a generous and a gracious, and also a discerning kind of way. This is a discernment piece at the very beginning. So we need to be looking at Dating and potential people, potential dates, not as dates and events, but as people who can be partners. You're discerning the possibility of a developing partnership, right? Now, some of you in here are like, no, I'm all good on that. I don't like size people up for dates. I don't go on dates. I'm not like that. I'm waiting for the one. Because you read Joshua Harris when you were in you know, middle school, like I did. Now, regardless of what you think about the book as a whole, the one is not some like magical unicorn that's going to emerge from, <laughs> from the young adult ministry at your church when you graduate, okay? That you're going to be like, that's the one, bless them! And you just like, yeah, I found you, you're blind! That's, that's not how that's going to work. If there is such a thing as the one, okay, if the one actually exists, let me tell you how you're going to get that one. The one is going to emerge from a process of discernment and developing a partnership. Because it will shape you and shape this other person so that when you go together, it's not just some kind of like objective, like, List that you many of you have, right, of the potential partner that you want, but it will be this person as they truly are, meeting you as you truly are. And you can only do that once you've developed a partnership and relationship together. The one is not a unicorn, the one is a person that you've walked through life with. Okay? So some people are like, no, I don't objectify people in that sort of like physical or emotional way. I'm waiting for the one. You're objectifying them in a spiritual way. Not good either. Okay? So partnership. And discerning God's will. Now, I realize, friends, that the pre-dating phase, I'm going to try and kind of walk through the process. The pre-dating phase is usually pretty complicated, <laughs> emotionally, if nothing else. It's pretty complicated. Um, yeah, I'm not going to like try and put a lot on there. Let me just say a couple things. Instead of, if we're going to look at the way God teaches us to live and connect ourselves, instead of like flirting or gaming your way into like the other person's heart, right, you need to act honestly in a trustworthy fashion. Okay? You don't get to win a boyfriend or girlfriend as like some kind of prize at the county fair. Well, that's not a lot of how we act. We play hard to get, or like you dress a certain way, or like, you know, like you just... Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? You try to win somebody, that's not the point. You don't win anything, that's not how relationships work. You, you work at it together, you don't win it. Okay? When you talk and get to know somebody, be genuine, don't be like coy, don't play the game, right? The chase that we talk about sort of in the secular world, the chase is like this game, which is, you get all these like half hints, and it's sort of like, it's kind of dramatic, and, and it's fun, okay? But like, you don't get points in the kingdom for spontaneity. That's not how this works. <laughs> Jesus is all like, oh, gold star! Like, that was awesome! That's not how it works. <laughs> um, a, a, God work, a godly and trustworthy kind of pursuit of someone, consistent pursuit of somebody, right, where you're purposeful and proactive and honest, I think that's probably better, okay? If you have more than that, we can kind of ask more questions later, but I'm just moving on from there. Now, then it's like, okay, like, maybe, I, maybe you're doing that, you're like, okay, but when do you, like, when do you talk about it? When do you share your feelings, okay? Um, and this is good. This is a good thing you got you to know. Then you know the term DTR, right? <laughs> Find the relationship, right? There's actually, like, a music video, right, with this rapper. Yeah, I know him. He's a friend. He's a guy, right? Um, right. Okay, my best advice with the DTR, I think it has a valuable place. I think that like people think of it as some kind of magical like process. It's not really like that. 
Uh, like you, I think, here's how you should think about it. Sharing your feelings is an important piece. Defining the relationship because of sharing your feelings is an important piece. My best advice is that you share your feelings when you have a sense of purpose to go with it, okay? Guys in particular, this will probably have to be you first, okay? Uh, and also given that ladies, you tend to be more emotionally intense and self-aware. Guys, we can serve them by not kind of playing with their hearts. I know a lot of people are sort of like, well, like, I want to put myself out there, but like not too much. So like, they're like, hey, I really like you, but I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> kind of go, you're like, ha ha. And then you kind of make them kind of come back at you. But that's not very helpful. Um, I, I never tell like, them. Whenever I like someone and I'm like, I'm not sure that I should go after them, I don't tell them. I think you have to exercise some self-control. Because like, why would you just want to stir up drama and feelings if you're not going to act on them? Oh, that's right, that would be a we-centric way of interacting with someone, right? Okay. So that's just sort of how I think you should think about it. Um, if you like somebody, make sure you know how you feel. And don't just say, hey, you know, I like you. You, you need to think about what does that mean? Are you willing to kind of follow up with that? Um, so only if you're interested in a partnership do you express that. Because I think in general, but ladies in particular, you know this well, expressing feelings is an expression of commitment. Men, let me, let's hear that one more time. <laughs> expressing feelings is an expression of commitment. And if you don't agree, you should go to the singleness talk upstairs and think about how to sort your own life out. Because women are going to read that differently than you. That's not fair to them. Okay? Alright. That's an expression of commitment. Again, I would express self-control. Suck it up. Don't play the game. Don't just act on feelings if you don't actually want to move forward into the partnership. Um, Notice that emotional vulnerability is not a fruit of the spirit, but self-control and perseverance are. Okay? All right. All right, moving on. Um, and just briefly, when you, when you have a DTR, yes, you talk about your feelings, right? You might not always kind of figure it out in one go. I think sometimes ladies put a lot of pressure to kind of like fix it all in one go. I think like you can have a little bit of space there. The idea is. Here's where I am, my feelings are this way, and I'm committed, like, I'm, I'm, I'm open to discerning, like, should we kind of move forward with this, right? You have to say it as often as that, but, you know, <laughs> right? And then, um, you don't have to figure it all in that one night, right? But you, it is good to, like, have some sense of commitment about what you are going to do, right? So you could say, normally what will happen, like, in my experience, is like, okay, like, yeah, like, I think I'm interested in you too, but I want to figure that out a little more, and I want to pray, and so, like, why don't we... Spend more time intentionally together, and just, again, we're in this middle space. You have some freedom, but you also have some commitment, which is helpful for helping you move forward to figure things out. And again, that's not a binding commitment. You can always back out there, right? Um, but that, that, I think, can be a helpful way to be like, you know, we're like not all there yet. Let's kind of, like, move forward, and then we'll figure it out as we go along. But we're committed to moving forward. And if you're like, I'm not interested, you just need to say that. I'm not interested, okay? Don't play with anybody. God, ladies, don't take advantage of us as we kind of put ourselves out there like that. Um, it, 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 is, it is hard. It's a little scary. Um, yeah, you need to listen to each other, be open, and listen to what each of you are feeling. And again, you have the freedom to back out. DTRing is not marrying the other person. Dating is not marrying the other person. Even engagement is not marrying the other person. Only marriage is marrying the other person, okay? So you have freedom there, and you need to be discerning and developing the whole time. All right, so let's say you navigate that pre-dating phase well, and you're like, yes, here we are, we're moving forward. You're Facebook official, you've told all your friends about it, you've like, in small group, you always co-op like one small group, like afterwards, like, and you just tell everything that happened, or if you're a guy, you're like, yeah, we're, uh... We're together now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes, oftentimes. And man, you should work on it too. It's good, it's, good to be, it's good to feel warm and fuzzy too, guys. It's good for us. Right? Now what do you do is the question. So once you've made it official, what do you do with that, right? You're stepping it up. How do you develop that partnership, all right? And I'm going to look at the triangle and I'm going to point out the three places you need to focus on to develop that partnership. It's not a foolproof plan, but look at the structure. It'll tell you what to do. That's why it's called structure. The first thing you need to do is you look at this arrow between me and God, the supply part. My relationship with God. First, I've always got my own relationship with God. i got to care about that. That is the supply from which all of my choices come, whether in this relationship or outside. All of my life choices need to come from my relationship with God. That's what Christian living is about. Drawing on God's strength and His teaching for everything that I have. Being a good partner in a relationship, that means that you're holding up, you're, you're managing your own space well, okay? Particularly, you're protecting your space with Jesus. So if you're not at that place, like, you might need to step it up. You might need to step up your level of being a disciple. Hopefully you kind of work this stuff out beforehand, but I realize it's not always like that. You have to choose. that You're like, yeah, I'm going to be a good partner. And being a good partner is getting serious about my own life. Because so the person ostensibly is serious about my own life. So if I'm not serious about my own life, man, right, we got a problem. Um, and that means also protecting your participation in, relation, in other Christian community settings. You need to have other circles and outlets, like small groups, 
a discipler or a mentor of some sort, right? Accountability partners and things like that. These things are helpful for you. Oftentimes in a relationship, especially like early on, you know, I know what happens if you kind of like spend a lot of time together, but like the long run pattern has to be that you are investing in relationships outside of your significant other. Honestly, the more you invest in those, the more you meet Jesus there, the better person you're going to be, the better person you are going to be able to develop and discern what God is doing, and the better you're going to be able to serve the other person. So it actually serves everybody if you invest in your own life, right? So if you're dating someone, don't pull them from small group to go on a date with you. And if you're, if you, if, you know, maybe your boyfriend's got a rough week and he's like, oh, I want to hang out, but I haven't done my quiet time yet. Again, I'm not trying to put a rule there, but like you got to question yourself. What are you going to ask him to do? Well, come on over. You know, I haven't seen you like all half day. Right? Come see me. Right? He hasn't talked to Jesus all day. I'm just saying. Right? You got to think about helping. You know, you got to invest in your relationship. Right? With the Lord. And and sometimes your significant other will not you know, let you do that. You got to push that back. You're like, no. Hello, you and Jesus matter. The second thing is, so that's the first arrow. The second thing is, I need to care about this other person's relationship with the Lord. And um, sorry, I lost myself in my notes. Are you supportive of their life with God? Do you encourage them to spend time with Jesus or to ignore him on your behalf? Do you pull them from Christian community or Christian practices for your sake? Right? I, I don't mean all the time. But I don't mean like once. I mean like think about the patterns that you're doing. Right? Being a good partner, that can actually mean spending less time with them so that they have the necessary space with God. Right? So I'm in a long distance relationship, I'm in a long distance relationship with somebody right now. We talk on the phone a lot because like we, we're just like that's how we like we just connect really well so we talk all the time. Right? We're on Skype for like three hours. I was on Skype with her, I was on the phone last night with her for a little while. And like it got kind of like, we're like, okay, we should probably stop. Because like we gotta sleep and get up in the morning. And like I need to spend time praying before like I'm just like, okay, good night. Right? I need to protect my space and we, we're protecting each other's space with the Lord. That means self-control. That means, you know, I'm not gonna hang with you right now. Like, don't worry about it. I'll see you tomorrow. Spend time with the Lord, have less time, right? I need to care about them. I can't control that, right? I can't make my significant other want to love Jesus more. And if they're not wanting to, again, you've got a question, kind of, you want to discern where they are and where you are together, but are you supportive of their life with God, right? My life with God, their life with God. And the last thing is our interactions with one another. Your relationship with each other. Now, you don't have to talk about Jesus 24-7, like, in everything. Like, that can get a little cheesy, I understand. That feels a little forced, right? But you do need to devote specific time to God together. I do think that's true. Um, some people pray together. Some people read a book, the same book at the same time together, right, and kind of talk about it. You are not each other's accountability partners in general, but like you are setting aside a specific space, right? Just like you have your own walk with God individually, and you're also in a small group, right? As a couple, you each have your own relationship with God, and you also spend time as a couple with God, and it's okay, right? It doesn't have to be everything. But you do need to have, that needs to be part of your relationship, like a protected space within your relationship. What did I write here? Sorry, okay. Uh, outside of that protected space, though, you also need to ask yourself, how are we conducting ourselves in accordance with the will and the nature of God? Your words, your actions, when you are alone with each other, when you're in groups with each other, are you godly? Do you honor good boundaries, emotionally and particularly sexually? Are you moving frequently, accidentally into sexual temptation or sin, or emotional kind of like codependence with each other, right? Are you ensuring that how you converse and interact is constructive? You know, I like saying sweet things to my girlfriend, but like, there's also more than that, you know? Kind of got to be able to meet each other on multiple levels there. It's how you conduct yourselves, even apart from like the Christian time, is it still Christ-like? So here's how like, just some practical thoughts about sort of moving and living that way kind of more generally. It's more about your character, right? One good thing, one difference that I've learned, there's a big difference between pleasing and serving somebody. A partner is somebody that I serve, who serves me, and I serve alongside, right? A partner, eye to eye, side to side, fighting out together, bam, right? I serve them because we are walking together in this thing. But a codependent is someone that you please, and vice versa. You may have a significant other who likes you to do certain things for them, that could be sexual or otherwise, right? And if you do it, they'll be pleased, and you'll have intimacy. That's not serving the nature that God has created you to be in, in your relationship at all. Serving versus pleasing. Serving centers on God's expectations. Pleasing centers on my expectations, or her expectations, or you know, the other person's expectations. Um, another way to kind of test that, read 1 Corinthians 13. A lot of us go to weddings and are like, oh, it's so happy. It's like a sappy, fuzzy passage. Have you ever read it? Are you kidding me? That passage is hard. It hurts. It's 
It's a reminder that love is about dying to self, right? Let's take a look at this. Love is patient. It is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It doesn't dishonor or denigrate or condescend other people. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't rejoice at doing wrong. It rejoices in truth and the rightness of things. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. All of that is really hard if you have to do it. So that's to talk about. When you're the one who's got to be patient, kind, unenvious, not boastful, not self-seeking, not easily angered, that is hard. So 1 Corinthians 13, that could be a good template to remind you, like, okay, we think we're in love. I say I'm in love with her. I say I love her. Do I look like this to him or to her? It's a good check. Again, I'm not trying to impose it as a rule. But think about, like, what is the nature of my character and my choices and how am I acting, right? 1 Corinthians 13, that's a good place to start. Um, another one is the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to go there, that one hurts even more. It's way more direct, you know? So, again, are you looking like Jesus in life and in your life with the other person? Are you looking like Jesus? Friends, if you look at these lists, if you look at this whole thing, I think you really need to search yourself. Some of you in here should not, not actually be in this seminar. You should be in the singleness one because your emotional and spiritual life are in a place where you really need to meet Jesus there first. And I'm not blaming you for being here, but if you really think about where you are, some of you, you need to recognize that, oh, I've got a bit of disorder or dysfunction or stuckness in a spiritual or emotional way or even a physical sexual way that I don't know what to do with, right? Think about that. Where are you individually? If you're here as a couple, where are we? Are we we-centric we or are we God-centric? How do we look? How do we act? What are we doing? Ultimately, friends, here's where I kind of want to leave this as far as like if it works. Relationships are a gift. They are a gift. And if you look at this, the list that we talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, or if you look at pleasing versus serving, if you look at this, this gives me a lot of cause for fear, right? Because like I am just not that patient or good or kind or loving. I'm not. I'm tired at the end of the day. I'm pissed off that the test didn't go well, and I want you know, my significant other to comfort me, but she's got her own test or whatever, you know, we're just mad. It's hard, right? There's a lot of space for fear and trembling, and that's actually not too bad. It's okay to approach that, feel that fear, like, oh, okay, like, I don't, I'm not up to the task. You're not. You're not up to the task. Ultimately, the marriage covenant, right, to love unconditionally forever is completely impossible by human effort alone. Dating is practice for living that tension, okay? But it is also a cause for great rejoicing if you look at this because it means that God is going to be the one to supply and meet us and lead us. I'm not the one who has to control everything. I'm not the one who has to lead everything and figure everything out and know all the answers. God knows the answers. God is going to be the one to supply me with specific choices and specific answers and also the character I need to move forward. And friends, that is a good thing because we centric relationships can leave you feeling very alone even if you're with someone. This, my friends, I think is much better. There's a place for trembling. It's a place for receiving a lot of joy, knowing that God is the one who upholds this. And if you will live in that tension, I believe that you can meet God in really deep ways, and God can meet you guys in really deep ways. Your relationships that you have, um, they can also be really wonderful gifts from God that sharpen and shape you and reflect the love of God, both in fun ways and in challenging ways. Right. I'll say one final word. Sometimes relationships don't work out. Oftentimes they don't. I'll simply say, breaking up also needs to look like Jesus. Breaking up also has to look like Jesus. You still have to care about your relationship with God when this relationship ends. Meet the Lord in your pain and in your grief. It's okay to be sad. I know a lot of the times there's a temptation especially for men to say, I'm over it, I really, really quickly. Guys, it's okay to be stuck and grieving for months on end. That's not, like, that's normal. Pain is pain. Hurt is hurt. Heartbrokenness is heartbrokenness. It's okay. Meet the Lord here. I still need to care about that. I still need to care about God and the other person. And so when you leave, you need to not, well, God and the other person and my interactions means that I need to not kind of believe God hates this person because God does not hate that person. You guys have, may not have interacted very well. Things may not have worked out, but God does not hate either of you. God is still God of both of you. God still loves both of you. You don't get to act as if God doesn't love the other person, Okay? doesn't mean you have to be best friends. In fact, you probably shouldn't be talking for a while, to be honest, to be able to get clear of that, right? But God still loves both of you. You know, one of the worst wounds from my life is my, the last girl that I dated when I was in college, um, we were in a place where, like, emotionally, I was more committed than she was, okay? And she had the freedom to leave. That's what dating is. So you can say, no, I'm done. We're out, okay? But the nature of the way that she left hurt really badly. She said, well, you know, I don't think that the Lord wants this for me anymore. I said, okay. What do you mean by that? 
Because I feel like the Lord is kind of like still kind of calling me to kind of be present with you. And she's like, no, 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 God agrees with me. He does not agree with you. And I kept like asking, why? What do you mean, that? What are you talking about? She would never give me an answer. I'm not bitter. I don't blame her for it. But realize that that left a pretty intense spiritual sting on me, believing that God is against me. That was not gracious of her. I also should have been more gracious to be like, you know, you actually just want to get out regardless of your answer. I should just let you go. I should have done that too, right? But you see how even in the departure, you must be like God and forgive and let go. You will be angry. You will hate them for all the little things and all the things that they've done, right? They may actually be the one in the wrong. They cheat on you or whatever. I get that, okay? But how you leave, how you leave and how you leave them must also look like Jesus at all times. Okay, we got a couple minutes, 15 minutes now at this point. I actually moved faster than I thought. For question and answer. Uh, uh, can you talk about gender roles? And specifically, uh, there seems to be a set of gender roles that is embraced. And mm -hmm. should we accept those intentionally? Should we reject those intentionally? Or somewhere in between? Sure. And which ones, too? If that yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. Um, gender roles become a problem if they're about power and not about service. And most of the time I hear about them in churches they are talking about power and authority. They're spoken very harshly. I, I don't quite get that. Honestly, if you look at, in my experience, right, so like if you look at me kind of theologically, my choices, I'm all about sort of men taking responsibility, owning up to their mistakes, being vulnerable, being open, okay? So like you could call me, if you want, in a personal level, a complementarian, right? But I pretty blatantly disagree with the cultural manifestation of complementarianism because it usually is... is expressed as a form of chauvinism against women and denigration of women. Okay? So if it's about power and not about service, you have a problem. Even if you're theologically correct, it's not about power, it's about service. Right? We talk about sort of submitting to one another, that's service. Dying for somebody, that's service, right? The only thing that headship and complementarianism buys you if you're a guy, if you really read it, it means you get to die first. Uh, <laughs> okay? So that's sort of where I kind of come from theologically with that. But again, if you look at my own choices, I'm all about sort of Man stepping up, right, in and of itself. I don't have any, I'm not trying to enter that debate in and of itself. When it comes to gender roles specifically, um, as you serve one another in developing your partnership, talk that out openly. There's got to be freedom to disagree, and also freedom to agree, and freedom to discern together. So I have no qualm with someone who believes scripturally and personally that, you know, the primary calling of one usually, it's the way it often looks, is like to uh, be in the home and raise a family. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? But why you arrive there is pretty important. Do you arrive there because it validates a male sense of, I earn more, therefore I'm better. I see I'm providing for my family. Is that what it buys you? If you're a woman, does it buy you? Oh, well, I don't have to worry about all of this stuff now. Okay? What does it buy you? Why are you there? Why did God call you there? It's not just a role. It's a calling. Calling is something that God issues from his own mouth unto your life that, make, that meets and is particularly attached to you with your idiosyncrasies and your gifts and everything about you, right? There's nothing wrong with the roles in themselves, but why you arrive there, how you arrive there is deeply important, I think, between me and the Lord, not so you and the other person. Does that make any sense? Um, my question is just that as you get more serious in a relationship, mm -hmm. I feel like it's a very fine line in emotional boundaries in being vulnerable and honest when it's hard to be and not crossing that emotional boundary like being too attached or too, like, do you need too much emotional comfort from that person? Yes. Is there any insight for that? <laughs> yeah. Um, you get a little help from your friends, you know, to quote the song. But that's why, again, I believe having accountability, right, with somebody, and you can use the term accountability partners. I don't, you don't have to, right? Some of you think there's a certain way to do that. That's fine, right? Accountability partners, small groups, discipleship, mentorship, right? Those places, like, if you are able to be freely honest with them about the way you're being freely honest with your, or, like, interacting with your significant other, that's a good start. So, like, if you are, like, if you don't want to tell your disciple that you told your significant other certain things, or that you did certain things, that's a good guilt indication that you probably are going a little too far. Or, at the very least, you might, it might actually be okay, but you've got to let someone else in there to tell you that it's okay, to kind of, like, nudge you. Again, I would also get a diversity of opinions. Like, I wouldn't go to, like, one church and, like, snag everybody, right? Like, snag all these parts, right? Because people come from different backgrounds and traditions and experiences, and they've known you from different stages of your life, right? So I may have someone who, like, maybe tends a little more centrist in their theological leaning, and I'm also part of a church that's maybe a little more conservative. That's fine. You know, having different, these things, they know you in different ways. They all are going to bless you, right? Um, but, yeah, you know, as you, you work at it, it's something you got to be praying about. I think if you feel that, like, that's a good indication. 
Like, normally it's like, oh, the bridge is so close, it's like great. And I'm like, mmm, I don't know about that. Like, yeah. you, you're not, you know, and so I think if you feel that, that's a good place to start. Um, and kind of each of you taking responsibility for not kind of going too far emotionally. You know, trusting people you have around you, really inviting them in, leaning into them, growing yourself, that's a great place to go. Kind of, better just more that, that he will help you preserve that. And you're going to make mistakes. It happens. You just keep going. You keep discerning, okay, did that wreck us, or can we return to this partnership that you're called to discern? You know, does that make any sense? Thank you from Virginia Tech. Um, how do you balance like the trust that you want to have with your partner and also accountability with your friends? Because I think there are definitely times where you know you need to work stuff out with people that you're in a relationship with, but you mm -hmm. also want to have people who are there for you. So any insight on like how to, you know, not necessarily separate those things, but actually make them work together as opposed to not breaking the trust that you would know, have in your relationship. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so if there are particular issues in your like relationship that are, you know, you don't normally want to kind of spill all your guts, right, is the idea, right? But you actually need your permission, from the, you need to, what you should want, you should want the other person to give you permission to be able to be freely sharing with your accountability people, right? So if like you're in a relationship with someone and they're like, I don't want you to talk about this with anybody, that's probably a problem. They would probably not be like, you know, um, that's something you can probably get to enter into. You gotta negotiate a little bit. I, I, you know, all situations are different depending on the nature of the issue, right? Um, but I think that, so like with me, I've got an inner circle of guys kind of from all over various parts of my life, and they kind of know all the details and like the whole process of my relationship with the girl that I'm dating right now, right? And she knows they know all that. And we're okay with that. Like, I don't, like, tell every little thing, but every significant thing, and I invite them to ask me questions to determine what's significant. I can't always see that, right? And so letting them also, letting my kind of people guide me, right? I'm not just going to them and, like, here, dish my stuff, help me, right? They're also leading me as friends or mentors, being like, hey, I want to ask you about this. And are, like, can I ask you about that, or how's this been, right? And um, I really need to be open with them and really want their insight. And actually, my significant other needs to want their insight for our sake. <coughs> Right? So trustworthy people on both sides is very crucial to not, because like you're right, it feels like you're like, oh, who gets what space, and like, it doesn't have to be that way exactly. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, what are your thoughts on sexual boundaries? Um, don't touch places that bathing suits go. <laughs> uh, as far as like directly speaking, right? Um, <laughs> you get know I me? Mean? Um, even if you have clothes on them, don't touch places that bathing suits go. Uh, I think also, like generally, you don't want to be horizontal with the other person too often. Uh, like that can lead to kind of going further than you plan to. But actually just emotionally, that's not a place, you're not that side by side yet until you're married. So like, you know, like, oh yeah, like you know, my girlfriend's place, and we took a nap on the couch. Uh, probably not. You know, it's an emotional thing as much as a sexual thing. Does it make any sense? Probably not the best thing, right? So you're, like you're always going to feel like, oh, we're further along, than, you know. Um, but yeah, wear bathing suits cover, right? And the positions that you're in, that kind of is a good place to go. I mean, like, every person's going to be different. Some of you, like, you may feel, like, God may lead you to be like, no, you cannot go that far, even though everyone else can go that far. And like, for me, the way that I think of it is like, well, like, if you're doing more than making out, like, it's probably a problem. And like, you're making out too often, that's probably a problem. So like, you just need to think about, it's, it's about frequency and the depth that you're going as well, right? But um, does, that, does that help at all? Like, going along with, like, emotional boundaries and just, like, how close you are, can you be too close to a person that you're dating, like, to the point where it's, like, you're not supposed to be that close to them until you're married? Uh, yeah, yeah you can. Um, <coughs> what you do when you get there is hard. So, like, that's why you have to go there, right? Um, you don't have one life together yet. Right? When you're married, it's two lives band together, partnering one flesh, right? Until that day comes, you're not you shouldn't you probably shouldn't be doing like everything together all the time. Right? So it's it's both a pattern issue and an emotional issue. Like you can you can get there, but you also get there by doing certain things, right? So um, like you want to be involved in your significant other's life, that's good, that's legit, right? There's also spaces where like again, like just with the relationship with the Lord, the spiritual way, like I leave that's their space with Jesus, I don't touch that. I, I encourage that and I leave it be. It's not mine, right? There are probably also like social or recreational spaces that like they should have, 
And it's like, I'm not as interested in that anymore. You're like, no, 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 I want, like, you actually want them to be interested in that stuff. Because, like, having non-significant other connected <laughs> places are just, it's just good for them in general, you know? And so, like, sometimes if you kind of get too far emotionally, you may have to kind of, like, step back. Not, like, we're on a break or censure each other, but sort of, like, okay, like, we don't want self-control. Like, I, I don't like kind of getting there because you need something about rules and rules feel like legalism and legalism feels like bondage, right? That's not what this is about. But sometimes it's like, you know, so when I'm calling, when I'm Skyping my girlfriend on the phone, we have this like little rule for during the school week and she's got a lot of work for like an hour, right? We don't want to go there. Like if you're work week, you know, like let's do an hour if you have stuff to do tomorrow in a certain way. Like you gotta, you have, you have like projects to work. It make any sense. So again, continual processing and discerning. A non-Christian does not fit into this triangle. Do you understand that? A non-Christian does not have a relationship with God, and a non-Christian cannot want what God wants for the other person, even if they actually want it, because it's not supplied by God. Okay? And so, when I date a non-Christian, I end up not wanting what's really good for them, because wanting what's good for them requires me to be part of the process, but that is not actually how God means people. God can be people in his own space, in his own time, however he wishes, right? So, I wouldn't advise doing it, because even if you want somebody to get saved, you've created a structure that does not actually work for salvation because you're actually demanding something of them for you, which is commitment to you. That's not how witness actually is about. Witness is about giving somebody something so they can receive from Jesus and they can commit to that. When you're in a relationship with somebody, you're actually asking something that they cannot give you. They cannot give you God's design for love. Does that make any sense? Right. That's why you can't do it. It's not about like some kind of rule. It's about like you actually cannot love them correctly. And you can actually hinder the love of God in their life. And actually can hinder the love of God in yours. It's not a good place to be. If you have any more specific questions, you can find me at a meal or something like that. But thank you very much. Uh, it's been very good. Awesome.